Good morning, everyone. My name is Bill George, and we'll get the session started. Uh, Jamie Diamond is on his way. We have uh, four outstanding individuals to take on a very challenging subject, crisis, community, and leadership. And I think uh, we can all readily agree that uh, uh, with the crisis we face, the fiscal crisis in the world, the many uh, crises we have in terms of world peace and local conflicts, uh, problems with the environment and energy and health care, uh, that leadership is absolutely critical. And that in many cases uh, we can attribute the, the problems we're facing to poor leadership or failed leadership. Uh, we have four people with us today who can really speak to this question. In my experience, I have found that you never know how effective a leader is until they're tested in a crisis situation. It's easy to look good when things are good, but it's really in that crisis that you find out are they going to hold true to their principles, their values, and lead their organizations through that situation. Uh, so, and the real test is can you stay true to that? And of course, in the United States, we have a new leader and President Obama taking over, and uh, uh, there's a, a great test going on there as well. So, we're going to have the opportunity to hear from uh, uh, four people who can, I think, enlighten us tremendously. Uh, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu is on my immediate right who is uh, the leader of Israel's Likud party and has served as prime minister from 1996 to 1999. And on my immediate left, Mr. David Cameron, the leader of the United Kingdom's conservative party. Uh, and then on my far, uh, far left, uh, Anna Putin, who is a member of the Spain's uh, group Santander and also head of uh, uh, Benesto Bank. And then on my far right, Jamie Dimon, who is, uh, as you know, chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. And uh, so I think we have the opportunity to hear from four, two, uh, two people from, uh, if you will, the political arena, government arena, and two from the business arena. But in effect, we're all facing the same kinds of problems. So Benjamin, maybe I can start with you. I think the obvious question was to ask you about Gaza and all the threats on your borders. But I think I'd rather go back to uh, the time uh, about five years ago when you came in as uh, finance minister and were facing uh, uh, a crisis, if you will, and your economy was down, it declined about 7 percent in the, the previous two years. And, uh, and what you learned from that experience with your elections coming up on February 10th, uh, how you might take some of those learnings uh, if you are uh, re restored to the position of Prime Minister of Israel, how you might take some of those learnings into f facing the challenges you currently face on your borders as well as uh, in the economic crisis, if you would. Thank you and good morning. Uh, I think that uh, a recapitulation of what happened there I think might be useful at least to draw some uh, general, um, general conceptions about what direction do you need in uh, times of crisis. The crisis we faced was at the time the most severe one economic crisis that Israel faced in decades. Uh, perhaps the uh, only other one was the Six Day War, um, the, the period leading to the Six Day War where we had a similar recession. This one actually exceeded it. So it was a very, very serious crisis. We were, uh, we had uh, intifada, terror, tourism effectively stopping. People wouldn't go to cafes, uh, commerce at a halt. Um, we had uh, the Nasdaq uh, that had burst uh, and a lot of our high tech just uh, plummeted. And so um, uh, this is the time that I came in as finance minister, which was an odd choice to take on that position at the time. And um, I, thought, uh, I thought that there were three things that were required for us to get out of it. One was a clear vision of the problem and the solution. What was the problem? What's the solution? It has to be a very, very clear vision. And I'll get back to that, because without that, you're nowhere. The second is to have sufficient political power to drive the vision translated into a very concrete program, drive it through the political system. And the third is political courage, because no matter how, uh, how clear your vision is, and even if you have political power, you're still going to get hit. So unless you have the threes, the big three, the vision, the power, and the guts to do it, it's just not going to do it. It's not going to happen. The vision that I saw, the way that I saw the problem, was different from what I've just described to you. Uh, that is, everybody saw what I just described, the collapse of the NASDAQ, the uh, terror that we had. And people naturally assumed that the crisis that we had of a sinking economy, shrinking really, 
shrinking not only in GDP, shrinking in GDP uh, per capita. So our standard of living was collapsing year uh, in two successive years. We couldn't raise a penny on the international markets. And the international bankers kindly told us not to try. So the word wouldn't get out that they refused this and so on. I mean, we were in 11, 12 percent unemployment growing. So we were, we were in a bad way. I didn't think the problem were just exogenous factors. They certainly contributed to it. And this relates to what we see now. If you think the problem is exogenous, basically, then you will never get over the average of your competitors. If you think I'm going to be only as good as the outside conditions allow me to be, you're never going to excel. And you'll never do a particularly good job of anything. Because if you say, well, it's the world, what can I do? You don't get very far. I didn't think that. I had seen other countries that had been behind us in per capita income well before the NASDAQ had burst, well before the Intifada terror had burst out, uh, before this additional, uh, these additional blows to our economies took place. I had seen that other countries had overtaken us. And they were about our size, Singapore, overtaken us. They were behind us 20 years earlier. Uh, Spain, skip, skip the high tech. Spain, overtaken us in per capita income. Ireland, forget it, and so on. And I said, what is it that they were doing that we had not done before? And can we use the crisis, and this is an important point, can you use the crisis to affect structural changes that make, in my case, make my country, Israel, more competitive so that when we come out of the crisis, we'll actually have improved our position. And I thought uh, I had to communicate this analysis that said that we had structural problems in the Israeli economy, in addition to the other problems that we had faced in the technology markets and terror, that we needed to fix. And the way I communicated this, and this is, if you have a vision, you better be able to communicate it very, very simply to the electorate. So I chose to, uh, to do this in a, in a simple story, um, because the voters, at least in my country, are not intuitive economists. And, and anyway, econ economics is not an intuitive profession. It's counterintuitive, as you know, in many, many parts of it. So I decided to have a story. And the story that I described introducing our economic plan was of my first day in, in paratrooper uh, basic training. And it was, uh, they put us on a big field and placed in a line. And they told us to pair up. And I was the first man on the left. And I turned to the man on my right, put him on my shoulders, pretty heavy guy. The next guy was the smallest man in the platoon. And he got the heaviest guy on the platoon on his shoulders. And the third guy was a big guy, and he got someone small. And then the commander blew the whistle. And now we, we take this race. It's called the elephant race. And I barely could take a few steps forward. The little guy with the big guy on his back collapsed on the spot. And the third, third guy, the big guy, just ran, shot off like a rocket, and took the race. And I said, in the international economy, all national economies are pairs of a public sector sitting on the shoulders of a private sector. And in our case, the public sector got enormous, very heavy, and we were going to collapse like the little guy below. We had kind of come up to about 55% of GDP uh, in the public sector, and we, we were going to collapse. We were very close to collapse. So the uh, solution to this, in order to win the race or improve our position in the race vis-a-vis -vis the other countries, we would have to put the fat guy on a diet, on a stringent diet, very hard to do politically, David, as you know. The second thing we had to do was make the guy at the bottom very fit, very, very fit, which means put a lot of oxygen in his lungs. And that means, means three things, lowering taxes, lowering taxes, and lowering taxes. That got us into a big argument, which has been settled since. And the third thing was, even if you've reduced the fat man, and you've really got the thin man fit. And now he can go and run, and he wants to run. He sees a fence, stops. There's a, a puddle, stops. There's a wall, stops, barbed wire, and so on. The barriers to competition are going to hold back uh, a private sector that is uh, 
uh, carrying a streamlined public sector, so you've got to remove the barriers to competition. So we came out of that with three things that we were going to do. We were going to control government spending, we were uh, going to reduce taxes, and we were going to remove c competition. I don't want to get into the whole story. It involved also reforms in the capital markets, in our ports, uh, our pension system. While we were at it, we cleaned that up. Uh, our people said to me in the finance ministry, uh, Mr. Minister, you can't do that because you can't do this reform because if you do, uh, you're going to get a general strike, labor strike, for each one of these reforms. And I said, could you say that again? They said, yeah, you're going to get a general strike for each one of these reforms. I said, well, that's very good. That means if we do them all at once, we could maximize the number of reforms per strike. And that's what we did. We did batches of eight right from the start, eight and then another eight and so on. And the result has been that the Israeli economy has grown um, at about 5% and more a year uh, for the last five years. And we entered this crisis in better than most countries. And if we act right, we can use this crisis to exit from it earlier. So if I had to put it, the three things that you need to do, you have to set a vision and a program communicated very clearly. You have to have political power. We enjoyed that power at the time. And you have to have the guts to do this because to go against uh, organized labor was very, very costly. To go against the major banks, because we took a lot of their powers, especially in the savings, very, very costly. To go against your own constituencies in reforming welfare, the most costly. And as a result, I have to report to you that I paid a price. So it was one of the reasons we lost the last elections. But it may be one of the reasons we stand a good chance to win this current elections in a few days, because people appreciate the fact that we actually did something that was right that was beyond us. Because politicians do speak of the good of the country. But the only way you really test leadership is if you're willing to, uh, I don't want to say impale yourself, but if you're willing to actually pay political capital, your own, shed political blood, your own, in order to better the position of the countries. And voters have a, a surefire way of distinguishing um, leadership rhetoric from leadership. They really know how to do that. So that's as far as what we did. How are these three principles going to be used if we do make it to power now? First of all, set a vision. My vision is we can use this crisis, given the reforms we've already done, to complete them so that Israel, within 10 years, become one of the 10, 10, at most 15 years, becomes one of the 10 most competitive economies in the world, not in size, in per capita income, and in other indices of competition. I think it's perfectly possible. The second is to um, augment, to uh, have a strong enough government. Well, we'll find out, but obviously I hope to to be able to win and to be able, not merely to win, but to have a government that's structured on this mission. Because I view the mission not merely as saving jobs and getting through the crisis. My mission and my vision is that we will use the crisis to come out in an enormously improved competitive position. We did about 40 reforms, 40 big reforms. There are 40 left. I know what they are. I want to do them now. And the third thing is, uh, is obviously to have the guts to do it. Well, you're in it in order to do it. What do you sit in office for? Not to occupy the seat. It's totally useless and also uninteresting in the long run. Uh, in any case, that's what I think we need. Vision, political power, political courage. And uh, each leader has to do to tailor that vision to your own national economy. Each nation state has abilities and advantages that are peculiar to that economy. And if you'd like, later on, I'll tell you what I think those are in my country. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's very clear. And David, why don't you pick up from there? You've uh, obviously been engaging debates with Prime Minister Brown about uh, the future of the uh, uh, British economy and uh, to the extent you're going to nationalize or personally nationalize the banks and how you're going to get out of this uh, situation. Uh, maybe if you you and your party come to power and you're to take over as prime minister later this year. Give us some insights into how you would lead. Well, I think I'd like um, 
Beebe's metaphor about having a fitter private sector and a less wasteful public sector, but I've never been in the paratroopers, so I'm going to have to find a different story to back it up. I mean, the background in the UK is that we're facing the deepest recession for uh, maybe 40 years, and also the deepest recession, according to the IMF figures, uh, for any advanced country. And the other bit of background is obviously one party, the Labour Party's been in power for the, more than the last decade, and so my party's been out of power. And so the challenge of leadership in a crisis, if we win the next election, is going to be, is going to be huge. Uh, my answer is that I think what's required is a very big dose of, of realism, combined, I hope, with a big dose of, of hope. The realism, because there are no quick fixes, there are no uh, magic bullets to solving the recession, and I think politicians need to say so. But the hope, because, you know, we will come out of this, and uh, we've got to make sure that we come out of this stronger. I think both those things, though, the realism and the hope, require a frankness and a candor and an honesty about how we got here, about how we're going to get out of this. I think if people don't believe your explanation for the problems you're in, they're never going to believe your cures and your ideas for how you get out of it. I think what Bibi said about if you pretend it's all exogenous, if you pretend it's all beyond you, th then why should anyone listen to you? You know, if, if we spend all our time saying all of this recession, it all came from America, it's all subprime, it's all the fault of those estate agents, uh, uh, you know, then we're, we're missing a lot of the point, which is that we made mistakes in the UK, and I think we need politicians who are able to wipe the slate clean, which you can do uh, after an election, and say, yes, look, the regulators failed, the bankers failed, the politicians failed, uh, people themselves made mistakes in terms of over-leveraging, opposition politicians made mistakes, they should have been far, you know, everyone, I think the, the need to wipe the slate clean and have a realism and an honesty and a frankness about um, the, the, the situation we're in. It'd be wonderful to hear a little bit more um, from leaders uh, of the following short sentences. You know, I got it wrong. Uh, sometimes even in this circumstance, I don't know all the answers because I don't think anybody does. And also, that's not my idea, but I like it and I'm going to implement it. I think we need to hear those things a bit more from, from leaders. In terms of the realism, as I said, there's no one measure that's going to get us out of this. I think also there's a great danger of, of not hearing what um, uh, Benjamin just said, which is that you've got to make sure you're clear about the real problem. A and I think uh, in the UK case, um, I think we've wasted a lot of time on cutting VAT, on fiscal stimuli, uh, when actually we should have been focused on the real problem, which is the banks aren't lending. I I'm a monetary activist, but a fiscal conservative. Um, and I think that, you know, the fiscal measures just simply won't work unless we unblock the banking system. So I think we're going to be laser-like in our identification of the real problem, which is the, the nature of the credit crunch, and, and target our solutions um, at that. But even in that case, you ask the questions about nationalizing the banks or bad banks, uh, insurance schemes that we're trying in the UK, there's probably no one answer that is going to unblock uh, this system. It's going to be a range of things, and they're going to take some time. Um, in terms of uh, hope, I think we've got to convince people that there will be a way out of this. We need to demonstrate that all the things we do now are not just good at alleviating the recession and helping people, but are also part of uh, building a stronger economy for the future. So whether it is um, helping savers who've seen their incomes cut, that's good for now because you're helping people who see declining income, but it's good for the future because we need to encourage a culture of saving. Whether it's investment in green technology, that's good for now because it's jobs, but it's going to strengthen the economy for the future. I think those are important. Hope and focusing on the future, I think, is completely vital because in the end, what will get us out of this is a recovery of confidence. Uh, all the economist models in the world can describe to you how you can try and make up aggregate demand, but they don't really describe to you the real change in aggregate demand that comes when the consumers, the businesses, actually start thinking it's time to go and invest, it's time to start um, thinking about generating future investments, future profits, future jobs. And it's that unblocking of confidence that is the absolute key to this. Just a couple of um, last points um, uh, that I'd make. I completely agree with what um, uh, Benjamin said about, about courage. I think in politics, you've, you, particularly in difficult circumstances like these, you've absolutely got to be prepared to fail 
doing the right thing uh, rather than just chopping away and taking the easy path and, and trying to survive in that way. Um, in opposition, that's difficult to demonstrate because oppositions are there partly to oppose, to ask questions, to probe, to call a government to account. But actually in the UK, on the argument over the fiscal stimulus, actually we have taken a very um, aggressive stance, which is my view, is that borrowing 8% of your GDP, which Britain is uh, this year, is too much. Therefore, we can't afford a fiscal stimulus. It might be right for other countries. It's not right for us. I think it undermines confidence because uh, consumers aren't mugs and they can see that if you're going to spend a lot now, the taxes are going to go up in future and that actually undermines confidence. Now, that's a difficult, and, and that's actually, it's much easier as an opposition politician to say, yes, of course, let's go on a spending spree. Let's cut the taxes. Let's boost the spending. Let's forget about tomorrow. We don't have to worry about that. The government should be doing more, should be spending more. I just think that would be completely wrong, and I hope it's a demonstration of the sort of courage you're going to need in office to say in opposition, actually, that may be the easy thing to do, but it's the wrong thing to do. And I think it, people are beginning to see in the UK um, that the biggest bit of our stimulus, which was cutting value-added tax, at a time when prices in the shops were plummeting anyway, was a crazy thing to do. It hasn't encouraged the consumer. It's just added a debt burden that our children are going to have to pay off. Um, uh, so the, the, um, the other last thing I want to say, I think, is, style, is leadership style. Clearly, in a crisis, you need very strong leadership. You need decisive leadership. You need that courage that is to say, I'm going to stick to this path, and I'd rather fail doing the right thing than, than chop away and do the easy thing. But I think you also need a recognition that, that this is not a job for one man, uh, just as you can't be a chairman or one woman. I hasten to add, and the last person to lead us out of a crisis in Britain was a woman, um, one who uh, inspires me very much. Um, but uh, just as in business, you shouldn't be your own chairman and chief executive. In, in politics, you cannot be chairman, chief executive, and chief financial officer. You've absolutely got to have that team. And if anything, because the role of the leader in bringing people together, in making the whole country feel we're all in this together, we're all going to get out of this together, in trying to bring that sense of confidence forward, you actually need quite a chairmanic approach rather than uh, a, a sense that, um, as I think our Prime Minister sometimes is at the moment, is he's sort of chief financial officer, chief operating officer, chief everything officer. And that, I think, actually can give her the impression of, of frenetic activity, hyperactivity, uh, that's also ineffective. And that's a, not a good combination. Thank you, David. Jamie, let me turn to you. Both uh, Benjamin and David talked about courage. Uh, you certainly shown a lot of courage in stepping up to uh, uh, take over uh, Bear Stearns and, uh, on a weekend, I believe, without uh, exactly 100% uh, knowledge of what you're getting into, and then later over taking our Washington Mutual, which also had its own share of challenges. Uh, uh, you're really at the center of the uh, financial crisis in the U.S., sitting on top of the largest bank in the country. Uh, how do you see uh, the kind of leadership that's required to get us through this crisis? Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the things in crisis is that people say what happened in the crisis, but honestly, if you're not prepared beforehand, I think it almost doesn't matter. So, you know, uh, I was at a meeting one day, and a lady got up in front of my management and said, if you're a CEO or any kind of leader, you need, the one thing you need is people around you who tell the truth. Someone around you, one person, who tells you the truth every time something goes on. And I got up and said, if, you have, if you're a leader, you have 10 people around you, and only one is telling the truth, you have a real problem, and because everyone's got to do it. So, um, you know, I'm Bear Stearns. I got a phone call on uh, the night of March 13th. On my birthday, I was having dinner with my parents and my daughter and wife, and, uh, you know, the chairman and CEO asked me, basically, can you lend me $30 billion by the end of the night? So I said, no, I cannot. Um, and, you know, the press writes about the story about this financial engineering. You buy this company very cheap. And, and it wasn't the money. It was the extreme risk. I always compare buying that company to buying a house on fire. You know, financial companies implode. And as you know, we had not that much time to do due diligence. The beautiful part of the story is that the team who I called, you know, that Thursday night around the world, people got dressed and went back to work. And it was like 9 or 10 o'clock at night. So thousands of people. Uh, around the world and now around the clock for those three or four days and then, then in a room not room quite this big we went through every part of the company systems ops legal compliance all the trading books and all the traders had to come in and you know what we thought and what we can write what we can handle and uh, and that's the beautiful part of the story 
and uh, you know, the, and almost the same thing. One, one, we had much more time, um, but I think the, the people also had to know, by the way, that if we did this, we it wasn't going to be able to come out afterwards and blame people. I think that one of the terrible things you see in corporate America, and I don't, and the politics is is it more, even more of a contact sport, is when you see that people make mistakes and they're held high. You know, they're held, they're blamed. They're hung high on the polls as if somehow it's their fault and no one else's fault. And uh, it's, I find it almost embarrassing when managements, you know, have to blame people publicly. They embarrass them, they embarrass the family, they embarrass everyone. And I always say, well, where was the CEO? I mean, weren't they in the process? Didn't they put the people in the job? And, uh, you know, you know people are going to make mistakes. And we, people, when they make mistakes, particularly in, when you're in a crisis like this, they're going to say, hey, I think this is worth $4 billion. You, know, you can't fire them if it's worth $3.9 billion. And so um, they have to know that you trust them, that you have their back, that, you know, that if, obviously if they don't deserve the job, you might move them out, uh, but they have to know that you will be as indebted, as hard, we're hard as they do and take as much blame as they do because I, honestly at the end of the day, you know, the boss is the most important. We, we went through, and now this crisis has been going on for a long time, it's getting kind of old, I hope when we come here next year we're not talking about it anymore, although I, I wouldn't completely count on that if I were you. Um, but now we're going through this crisis for a long time, but I think the leader you have at the company the people at J.P. Morgan Chase, like every single people who worked for me, walked in at one point and said, hey, if I don't get paid, no problem. I understand. I, we're doing a lot of tough stuff. I completely understand. You got the board. You got the press. We didn't do have a good year. And, uh, and that's, the, I think, the kind of people you want. Every single one of them is looking at a tougher year and is pretty much at this point, what can I do? What can I do? And, you know, throughout the whole last month, every single one of them, you know, if their partner who has nothing to do with them in a business that, you know, that isn't what they're responsible for said, I need your help because your expertise, they would, you know, get in a car and go somewhere at midnight down to the Fed or in some kind of thing. So, uh, you know, we have a very competent, high integrity, you know, try to do the right thing kind of team. We make plenty of mistakes. I agree with you. We, make, we always make long lists. Here's the mistakes we made. So we can be very honest about them because there are a lot, you know, and, um, and hopefully you know, that kind of team will pull you through whatever kind of crisis you have. Great. Thank you. Anna, let me turn to you. You've certainly uh, shown a lot of courage in the last uh, 48 hours uh, taking on this uh, Madoff situation and I think uh, making this very, very major decision that you will uh, back up your private, uh, private clients' uh, investments uh, and recover 100 percent of that. That's a, a very, very bold leadership step. Uh, that your group has taken. Now, can you tell, share with us more about that? Because I know others have debated this same exact subject and come to a very different conclusion. Now, can you share with us kind of what, what values and principles went into this? And, you know, this is a very courageous step. Okay. Um, I'd like to start by saying that, um, you know, we have all of us, at least those that are old enough, like, like me, live through tough times, but it's clear that, that these are quite exceptional times and, and especially so for bankers, uh, for the banking sector. Um, and I'd like to start off um, giving my thoughts by something that uh, I think Shakespeare said in Twelfth Night that it's not exactly what he said, but more or less that some people are born leaders, uh, some people achieve leadership and some people uh, have leadership thrust upon them. No? And clearly the key uh, or the most interesting question is um, how do you achieve leadership? Um, and I believe there are three very important things. The first one we tend to forget is proficiency, and this applies to all kinds of sectors, private and public. You know, you need the knowledge, you need the technical capacity to get your job done, and this, this is very important. Uh, for us in banks, of course, this is to be proficient in risk, risk management. Um, and risk is not only credit, it's liquidity, it's operational, it's reputational, and I will mention uh, Madoff in, in a few minutes. Uh, so. Again, for us in the bank, what, what we have done in, in my group is uh, we spend, and I've, I've been there for 20 of the 28 years I've been in banking, but we have an executive committee that every week meets, and, and we have executives and non-executives just to review risk. Uh, we also have a, uh, a committee which meets twice a week, delegated from the board with a very independent risk function. They have a lot of power all the way down to the branch level, and they meet twice a week and, uh, and review risk. The second uh, very important quality, and uh, and of course proficiency is indispensable to this one is confidence. I mean leaders need to take decisions, many times very tough decisions. Um, and it takes confidence to lead the way, it takes confidence to adapt to change and realize you made mistakes, the environment has changed and therefore you have to change. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it takes a lot of uh, confidence also to listen to other people and maybe take a different action of what you were thinking uh, of doing. And I, I think this is also extremely important. An example of this in, in our group and, and in Banesto is uh, two and a half years ago when we decided to sell our real estate company. It was a huge uh, profit for us, 1.2 billion, but it was also compromising profits. I mean, it was 10, 15 percent less profit that year. And this is the kind of decision that is might seem easy, you know, Spain was a bubble, but it was not so easy because you're foregoing profits in the short term. Uh, and again, it takes confidence to take these decisions. Uh, and there's one clear thing, none of us, and, and sometimes people forget that, we don't have all the information. We have to take decisions with incomplete information. Mm -hmm. Even if you read the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal and you come to Davos, you don't have all the information. And so you have to assign probabilities and decide that, you know, what is the best course to take and, and decide, you know, this is the least risky uh, or the, the best thing for us to do at the time. And finally, uh, and this probably is the most important thing that we all have to do, is, uh, is to be committed. And, and this was mentioned before. I think you have to remain committed in the bad times to your mission, to your values, and we can have a whole discussion on values, to your constituents. For us, it's shareholders, but it's also employees, it's also customers, it's society, uh, it's your product. You have to be you know, committed to the products you sell. Um, and again, for us, and, and, and there's many, many examples, but and some of them as easy as, as if to stay committed, you have to be close to your customers. Maybe in tough times, you have to be closer to them and stop doing other things. Uh, commitment to a mission or to your customers, in Santander's case, means we took, it was not an easy decision to stick with our customers in the Madoff case, even though we think that we didn't do Maybe we made mistakes. It's not possible to sell to, always to the right customer. And, mm -hmm. But basically, we did it to protect our franchise and because we feel our responsibility to our customers. And, and there's, of course, many side effects of that decision. So uh, I think these are the key, the key issues. And at the end of the day, um, I think to stay committed to your customers and realize uh, that even though you might be wrong, and we have been wrong, of course, uh, maybe it was not the wrong decision. And, and when you take these kind of decisions, what we have to think is, well, we're going to assume risk in, in, in taking that, that route, but no, that it doesn't sink the ship. So I go back to the, to the confidence and, and the probabilities. You never have all the information, so you have to make sure that the downside is not going to do something really you know, bad for you, your country, your company. Or, so staying committed, I think, to this uh, and commitment in leaders is critical to, to what you're supposed to be doing. Well, it's a re remarkable act of leadership, I think. Everyone these days, just about every corporation I know says we put our customers' interests first. We're primarily concerned about customers, but I think this is the, the real test when things don't go the way you want them. I'd like to, to turn to ch ch changes slightly now. Uh, in fact, Benjamin, you, you alluded to this, but to kind of engage all four of you in a discussion, uh, everything I hear and read and talking to people, everyone's saying, can we just get through this crisis? We just get through the next six months. Just get through 2009. Everything's going to be fine. And you alluded to the fact of, no, a real leader is going to shape where we come out. How are we going to come out of this thing at the other end? It's not just a question of getting through a credit crisis, getting the banks to lend again. What's the shape of the market going to look like? Where's the real growth going to come from? And, uh, you know, what is your position going to be? Can you get the structural things done that you need to get done? Can you use this crisis? So maybe some of the rest of you can speak to, uh, to that question of, of how can you use this crisis not just to get through it, but to, uh, to shape things so we can really go into a period of sustained growth, either for our countries or institutions. Well, I think you can and you should. It's, uh, again, it's a lot easier for um, um, Israel to do that um, as opposed to India. Or, I mean, if we had to, suppose you put me on top of the American economy or the Chinese economy, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't been there, and you are so much part of the global economy mm -hmm. that you are much more dependent on things to happen. But understand, we have an economy, we have 7 million people, so our per capita income is maybe $25,000, depending on how you measure it. So we're not a big economy, but we can move, we can actually use this crisis. We're taking a fairly developed economy not a low-income economy. And what we need to get from the world markets and from the world capital markets is nothing. 
But this nothing, if we multiply this, whatever, little fraction, by two times or three times, it makes an enormous impact on our own internal situation. So while it's irrelevant for the world markets, if we have capital flows inside Israel now, so I think we will, if we do certain things I'll describe, then we can change our situation dramatically in a very short time. So we make, we use the crisis.